Good afternoon. Welcome to my office. It's good to be with all of you wherever you are. And um, it's exciting to be talking about the parable of the weeds and the wheat. I preached on it on Sunday. Um, I'm going to read through it again a little bit because this parable raises a lot of questions. So, um, as all of Jesus' parables do, which I think is kind of the point of the parable, the point of the parable is to raise questions, to um, call forth reflection and contemplation. Not so we get all the answers necessarily, but so that we start asking the right questions and start trusting God to lead and clarify as we go. So, if you have your Bible, please turn to the book of Matthew chapter 13. Um, and this is where Matthew, in, in his gospel, really introduces parables. Um, beginning in Matthew 13 with the, um, the parable of the sower, of the seeds in the four different kinds of soil. And this, this whole emphasis on the parables comes in the context of opposition. Jesus is being critically uh, taken apart by his opponents over his views about the Sabbath, his behavior. He's been called a servant of Satan. There's a whole dis discussion about that. Um, they, the, the, a sign is demanded and Jesus pronounces judgment on those looking for a sign. Then Jesus' mother and brothers are like, this guy's crazy, he's out of control, we got to take him home. So there's a lot of controversy swirling around Jesus. And he begins to speak in parables. And these are stories that typically make one big point. Um, part of the problem with interpreting parables is that we try to over-interpret them and make every little detail um, stand for something, when typically, um, though there may be many aspects of the story that represent other things, they're usually driving at one big point, and we don't want to over-interpret them. But they're not easy. It's not always easy to figure them out. So Jesus kind of gives the parable of the sower and the four soils as a kind of a paradigm so that it's as his disciples come to him later what did it mean um, that he explains and when they ask him why he speaks in parables he tells them that it is to bring dullness to the hearts of those who do not want to hear um, this is a fascinating aspect of biblical teaching that not only do does the word of God fall on deaf ears at times for different reasons, that sometimes it is part of God's work to actually harden hearts that are already that have already turned off their ears to the gospel. And so God continues to speak, but in ways, that that the hard-hearted people are oblivious to, unwilling to listen to, stuck in their arrogance and ignorance, and yet they are not without witness. And this becomes part of a hardening of their heart as God works out his plans for uh, both his kingdom to grow and also for judgment to come on those who oppose him. So that's a whole other conversation. Um, but Jesus gives that parable and as kind of a paradigm for how we're to think about our, all parables. One, they're all making a point for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. They're helping us um, to grasp what our minds can barely comprehend, and that is the goodness of God's kingdom, the power, the beauty of God's kingdom, where God rules and reigns, and where we live under him and in, a, in, in accord with his purposes. And so he doesn't just tell us, Jesus doesn't just tell us, he shows us through the parables 
different aspects of what God's kingdom is like. And uh, the second parable, and one of only three to receive an explanation, um, is found in verse 24, the parable of the weeds, or the parable of the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and darnel. It's it translated various, various ways. But Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because... While you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time I will tell the harvesters, First collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. So, um, we skip down over a couple of other smaller parables, also about seeds. Um, and... Briefly look at 34, verse 34, where Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Um, Jesus didn't always make it simple. Sometimes our little gospel presentations, and we need to think how we want to tell people about the gospel. Sometimes they kind of dumb things down. Um, I'm intrigued by the fact that Jesus uh, rarely invited people to come and have their sins forgiven. He did forgive sins. But what he called them mainly to was a vision of the kingdom. And whether they wanted his vision or not was what determined their faith. A lot of people walked away. Others walked towards it. And of course, part of the God's kingdom being here is the forgiveness of sins and right relationship with God. But Jesus doesn't hand out just some little um, pithy kind of bumper sticker slogan to help people understand faith. He gives them stuff that's not easy to understand. What are we to make of that? I'm not saying we need to make it confusing, but I but there was a purpose. First of all, there was something precious and mysterious and powerful about God's word. And the mysteries that were being revealed through what Jesus said about God's kingdom. Hidden things. And they were designed to create hunger, to create longing, to create curiosity. Or, in some cases, to harden those who already did not want to hear. So then, um, in verse 36, Jesus explains the parable of the weeds. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. So, um, let's go back now to verse 24 and walk through it a little bit. Just talk about uh, now that Jesus gives us an interpretive key for a number of the pieces of the parable. Um, verse 24, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. 
Uh, whenever a parable starts that way, it's talking about the whole parable and not just that first sentence. It's not like a man who sows his seed in the field. It's like that and everything that comes after it in the story. So Jesus loved um, these sowing seed metaphors. And of course, we had a big discussion in my church here in farm country, Illinois, about whether it's called sowing or planting. And I found out that it's people talk about sowing wheat and sowing oats and that it's a little different process or at least traditionally it was from planting beans and planting corn uh, in beans and corn you're being more precise you're you're putting something into the earth more uh, deeply so it's planting sowing when the seed is so small that it's just easier to scatter it over large areas somehow. Um, and maybe pulling a little dirt over on top of it. So, um, Jesus loved these parables of sowing, and I think I know why. Um, there's mystery in the process of sowing seed and of it growing. There's... Um, um, it's not something that we can make happen in any context. And so the seeds stand for a little bit different things in each parable. Um, in this parable, um, the man sowing seed is, we're told by Jesus, um, a picture of him, the son of man, of Jesus, um, sowing good seed in the world, namely sowing children of the kingdom. So the picture that we have here is of Jesus as he calls and invites and teaches and preaches. Um, what we gain here is a picture of the fact that a lot of of good kingdom people have been planted and sown into this world. And I think it's interesting that here in the middle of his ministry to the Jews, Jesus doesn't say that, you know, the field is Israel or my disciples. The field is the world. Um, throughout Matthew, there are clear indications that Jesus has a global mission. And the field is the world. The good, seed, the good seed, verse 37, stands for the sons of the kingdom, or the children of the kingdom, while the weeds are the children of the evil one, the enemy who sows them, the devil. So, um, Jesus goes out and sows seed in the field, which is a picture of responsive human beings who grow in healthy ways, um, as God's people of, in God's kingdom in the middle of this world. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. Now, a lot of people have tried to take this whole thing and make it say too much. Um, while people were sleeping, is that the church not doing its job? Um... The enemy came and then went away. What does it mean that he went away? I, I don't. Those are those are details in the story, um, but they don't necessarily have specific points in their own right. What's important is the sense that an enemy comes and deliberately sabotages the good things that God has set in store. And yet, it's hard to tell that this has happened. Um, when the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. And I said Sunday, there is a weed in, in the Palestine area that does this. It looks just like the wheat. And, and you can't tell until they start to form heads that there's a difference between the two. And at that point, the servants, who we find out later are angels are saying, why is there wheat in your field? Or why are there weeds in your wheat field? Where'd they come from? And he replies, an enemy did this. Um, 
There are other scriptures that tell us that we are already objects of wrath and judgment um, just by birth, by virtue of being born into a sinful world and embracing sin through our own choices and through our succumbing to temptation. So the point of the enemy sowing weeds is very simply that there is an enemy who draws people away from God and who desires to mess up the good things of God. And while uh, we are all responsible for our own choice as well, um, there is a sense in which um, those who are opposed to God are children of the devil. I believe Jesus says that in John, in the Gospel of John. And they're all growing together. That's one of the big points of this parable, is that good and evil are growing together. In particular, good and evil people. And it's not always easy to tell who's who. Um, Matthew makes it clear that there will be many who cry out, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these wonderful things in your name? And he will say, depart. I have no idea who you are. Um, so, one of the first difficulties that the angels have with what's going on in, in, in God's kingdom is that they can't always tell on the surface who's who. That is a good reminder for all of us. We do not always know who are the children of God and who are the children of the evil one because you can claim to be a child of God and be evil. And you can claim to not really know much about God and yet have an awareness of him um, and a responsive heart, even if you don't know all the right answers or have the, the Christian pedigree, etc. So when, when um, in the story, when the servants ask, should we pull up all the weeds? The master says no, which is exactly not what we would do. We would want to get those weeds out of there so everybody can live well together. But they're growing so closely that we're told you may root up the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And then I will tell the harvesters to first collect the weeds and burn them and then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. So the point is that Good and evil are going to grow in this world side by side and all intermingled and mixed up with each other. Now, this is about specific individuals. Um, but there are plenty of scriptures that also point to the fact that we ourselves are a mixture of good and evil. Even when we respond to Christ, uh, there are parts of us that are still in rebellion and that will, over time, conform to the process of becoming like Jesus. Um, but in this context, the good, the good wheat are those who belong in, in Christ, who are part of God's kingdom, who have responded and grown in healthy ways. The weeds are not. The weeds are a direct threat to the good things of God. Um, they're there to make life difficult. Folks, I don't know where we ever got the idea that following Jesus was going to be easy. I don't know where that came from. Um, I think that following Jesus is hard. <laughs> because we follow him to a cross where he died and where he invites us to be crucified as well. In the sense that our will, our destiny, our sense of control must be relinquished at the cross and crucified, if you will. Um, and we must be changed by the mercy and grace of Christ. And our willfulness must be corrected so that we are following Jesus now and not our own wishes, which is sin. So, um, But, but for the purposes of this parable, Jesus says, let the good and the evil grow together. That is so hard for us to do. We want so badly to engage in crusades against evil. We want to purify churches. 
We want to drain the swamp in Washington and, and clean it all up and, um, you know, fix this and stop that. And uh, if you remember after 9-11, I think there was even uh, rhetoric about, uh, you know, during the war on terror, if I recall correctly, that we're going to eliminate terrorism and evil around the world. Um, I think the people who say these kinds of things have never read the parable of the weeds and that we are not called to eliminate evil anywhere, not even in our own lives. We are called to grow, uh, we are called to mature, we are called to self-discipline, but nobody and no group of people has the power to fix all that is wrong with this world or even to fix much of it. Now you say, wait a second, are you saying we shouldn't even try? No, that's not what I'm saying. This is not the only text in the Bible. But I, th I think this text is trying to give us a perspective on what's happening in the world. And we need the perspective because we can be overwhelmed by the wickedness and by the evil uh, that is all around us, on all sides of the aisle, um, across cultures, across nations, um, in all peoples, and even within us, but particularly given its fullest expression in those who are resistant to the knowledge of God and to submission to his will. So we need to realize that good and evil are going to grow together in this world. Jesus tells us that here. Um, we shouldn't waste our time always fighting. Then we turn into kind of Don Quixote characters. And there are a lot of Don Quixote kind of churches. They're going to sit and rail against the world and rail against this and, and, and decry that and and, and we've got to fight the government and fight the libs and fight the secularists and fight the... There's just so many people to fight. Um, I think Jesus is calling us away from that kind of a mentality. And to say, I didn't call you to fight. I called you to grow. I called you to grow. Now, I know one of the questions is right away, well, well what about things like, you know, racial segregation? Was it wrong to stand up to that? Is it wrong to participate in like in, in a march for life or in a march for civil rights where we want people to be better treated or, uh, you know, or to, you know, to oppose the government when it does wrong? Uh, no, it's not wrong to do any of those things. Christians are called to give witness um, on behalf of, of goodness in the world. We give witness to our faith by saying, in Jesus' name, I'm going to go out and advocate for some person or group of people who are in less of an, uh, who, uh, of an influential position and can't advocate for themselves. That is fine. And that's good. We need to speak out against forms of evil. But that's different from trying to fix them or always being in some kind of combat mode. Why is that? The answer is in the parable. Because as you're pulling up the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. In other words, when we go in with real draconian and extreme measures and are ready to take some prisoners out there, and I don't mean literal prisoners, but we're going to fight. You know, we're going to go after some group that we think is wrong. There's almost always harm that is done to innocent folks or to folks whom God is um, calling to be part of his kingdom. I think about warfare. Um, you know, Christians have different views of warfare and what constitutes the appropriate use of full force and military. Um, I am a, what I would call, <clears throat> a very, very cautious just war uh, adherent. Um, the other positions would be pacifism, which refuses any violence. Uh, a lot of early church was pacifistic. People don't realize that. 
just war means that only defensive wars uh, as last resort can sometimes be justified. And um, then you have more holy war types who feel like a quick use of the military uh, against wrongdoers is, is okay for Christians. I am a cautious just war type. I think warfare uh, should be used extremely cautiously because it may sometimes be necessary, but warfare always harms all kinds of people, whether it's the uh, soldiers themselves whose lives are lost or whose bodies and minds are, are uh, broken, um, whether it means the uh, civilians who are caught in crossfire, uh, whether it means the uh, economic and sickness things that, that often occur during downturns and sickness and starvation that often occur during wartime. So we may be trying to fix a problem over here, but it will create other issues over there. And unfortunately, the church has a huge history of using violence and extreme measures and torture and genocide to try to... Um, get its message across or gain power for itself in the world. And not only have those tactics harmed countless people and, and taken lives, they've also harmed the church's witness right down to the present, where many people are turned off by the poor tactics of the church as it has engaged in... Um, military methods or or political methods to try to try to save to try to do God's will um, it's never our calling our calling is to be the church sure if we can cooperate with the government here and there on a few things great uh, I'll partner with just about anybody to do some good but um, but whenever we substitute a partnership with the state or with a political party or with um, you know the instruments of war to try to get our spiritual agenda across, we've lost the battle, um, and we will do tremendous damage to the good crop, trying to fix and root out all that's bad in the world. So we we we're called to live within the tension. God's kingdom is growing. So is the world. Um, so is uh, the kingdom of the world. Um, it's not always easy to tell who's who. We're all kind of intermingled together. <clears throat> and so we got to be careful of real draconian methods of trying to separate things out before it's time. In other words, it is not our job to be the judge. Now, people have taken this to say, well, don't, shouldn't we make, are we not to make decisions and make judgments? Of course we are. The Bible makes it very clear. The Gospels are calling us to look and discern and weigh and, and listen and respond. But we are not to make ultimate judgments, and we are not to put ourselves in the position of deciding who's in and who's out. We simply don't know. We are not the judge of this world. We barely understand ourselves and why we do what we do as individuals much less being able to judge the world before it's time. I hope that there's both um, permission to relax and encouragement to be careful. Um, relax because we don't... <coughs> it's not our responsibility to figure everything out in this world. Um, especially deep, difficult issues that are hard to resolve and hard to fix. We may have a part to play, but it isn't our job to be responsible, um, to make ultimate judgments and fix things in this broken world. And we will often create bigger problems when we try to do that. So, uh, what does Jesus say? Do we just live like this forever with some good happening but evil flourishing and just do our best? Um... First, uh, sorry, verse 30 says, Jesus says, 
let both of them grow together. Let both of them grow together. Um, evil's going to do what it's going to do. Satan and his kingdom is going to do what it's going to do. We are to grow as well. And we are to grow constantly in knowing God, loving God, serving God, knowing our neighbors, loving our neighbors, serving our neighbors, knowing our enemies, loving our enemies, serving our enemies. Uh, we're to grow in all of that. <clears throat> and that kind of growth will dictate how we interact with the evil world around us. Not in a reactive, get them away from me phase, because this parable makes it clear that ain't never going to happen. <laughs> We're all mingled amongst each other together. But we will learn how to be ourselves as Christ followers in this world. We will learn how to love and serve the weeds around us. Um, we will learn as we grow how to, um, how to influence the people around us who are not part of God's kingdom. Now, this is just a simple parable. It can't get into, you know, this doesn't talk about conversion and how a weed becomes a wheat. That's not the point. There are other passages that deal with that. The purpose of this passage is simply to say, God has an agenda, so does the devil, and sometimes it looks like they're all mixed up together, and we don't know what to do, and so we'll try to well, we got to get rid of all this stuff, and we end up doing great damage through our extreme efforts rather than trusting the sower, trusting that Jesus knows who belongs to him and that he will keep them to the end. Jesus says, um, the harvesters are the angels, and as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. So Jesus has a plan for this world, um, for the brokenness and evil, and it will one day be eliminated. In it. Eliminated. This is part of the teaching about the return of Christ that he will come to finish what he started, to root out evil, to judge it, to do away with it, and all of the pain that it causes. And, um, um, and to deal permanently with those who are wrongdoers and who cause others to sin. Fascinating. A wrongdoer is basically a lawless one. One who has no regard for God's law, for God's character, for God's guidance and leadership. The other person mentioned here is those who cause sin. Those who cause stumbling. These can often be religious people who make it difficult for others to go to God. They are uh, to get to God. These are called weeds. And another evidence that we don't always know who's, who's who. We don't know who's who, but the Son of Man and his angels as he directs this operation of harvest, which is a separating. If you think of it, harvest is a gathering in and separating of that which is good and useful from that which is not. Whether you're gathering the whole, um, you know, the whole fruit and plant, basically, like you do with... Um, oh, I don't know my gardening very well. Brussels sprouts. Um, or whether you are cutting out all the stalks and just gathering what is useful. Um, what's happening is a separating away. The useful, the good from the unuseful. Uh, this is not meant for us to have a real black and white image of I'm in, they're out. That's there's a lot more <laughs> nuance to such things. We can't always tell, as this parable makes clear, who's in and who's out. Um, but but one way or the other, God knows who's in and who's out. God knows who belongs, who's responded, who's growing as healthy um, vegetable matter, 
and he knows those who have not. And at a time and place of God's choosing, God will make decisions. God will sort through all of it. God will separate that which was unuseful, which was opposed to him, uh, the individuals and groups of people who refused to listen and who caused harm in this world. Uh, God will separate those, and God will gather to himself uh, those who belong to him, the good wheat. We're told in verse 42 that the harvesters, the angels, will throw the weeds into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, um, we know that hell is a part of Christian teaching. However, I did not know growing up that there were different views on hell. Uh, all I heard growing up was the literal fiery uh, lake of fire with burning and eternal torment. And it was based on texts like this, among others. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. However, once I grew up and read some books and looked at some church history, I realized there were a number of views on hell, even though the uh, hell fire, uh, eternal burning um, image was one of the most popular ones in certain parts of church history and certainly during the Middle Age uh, when the church wasn't terribly concerned about being a little harsh. <laughs> um, but I did not realize that other people see the these uh, pictures of a fiery place of pain and weeping and gnashing of teeth as uh, metaphorical, that they are representing reality, but not a literal reality. Um, and a lot of that is based on some of the Greek words. Um, the fact that God's judgment throughout Scripture is always, is, is often symbolized by fire. And that, in fact, it could... Uh, that there are a couple of other views of hell. One is the annihilationist view, which says that this simply means that a person is destroyed. There's no eternal punishment, but there is pain and sorrow from not being part of God's people and then and destruction. Others believe that, the, that hell is a place um, and that, but it's a place of, of punishment and judgment where we are cut off from God and separated forever from him. And that's what the fire is symbolizing, judgment and separation. I tend to lean more into that camp, uh, but whatever camp you are in, um, it's clear that there will be a judgment day. That is not, the Bible is unapologetic. There is, an, there is a day of evaluation and it is at that time that God will make all things right. Those who have done evil to their reward, those who have been transformed by his grace and live in Christ to their reward. To the one they will be outcasts, even though they may have looked like wheat or thought they were wheat or said they were wheat, God knows the hearts. And all weeds, all those who don't belong to him, will be disposed of. Verse 43, Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. That's a wonderful image. That is what it will look like when the people of God are on full display. When there is no confusion, when there is no evil and murk and uncertainty all around us. But when we are... Uh, fully revealed for who we are, and when we fully become who we were meant to be, which First uh, John says, um, we know we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And we'll be changed by that. And there will be, uh, we will shine like the sun. The radiance will be unimaginable of those who have been made whole and forgiven, 
and completely freed from sin and and sadness and the sources of sadness. Um, friends, we need to hang on for that day. Let's press along to glory land as we used to sing growing up, where we are doing what God calls us to do even in the midst of a broken, broken, dysfunctional world. We don't let that get us down. We keep moving forward. We keep even interacting with it and seeking to represent God well in the middle of it. But we're doing so trusting that he will one day make all things well and all things good and right. Boy, that is exciting. That is exciting stuff to think about where we will shine like the sun. I'm going to get out my little pom-pom here that I have on my table today. That's another story. But we will shine like the sun in radiance, in splendor, in majesty, uh, in the fullness of, of who God wants us to be. Let the one who has ears, let them hear, says Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you, um, you know what's going on and you know what you're doing. And I pray that we can have tremendous confidence in you, that we need not live in fear, but live in faith. That, that you are who you said you are, that you're Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And, and, and that our calling isn't to try to fix all that's broken and wrong and evil in this world, but to be salt and to be light, to influence the world toward you. And I pray that you give us discernment to know uh, what we're to speak up on, when and how, um, to give witness to you but not to be overwhelmed by trying by, by the wickedness of the world, nor by the need to somehow straighten it all out. Help us to trust in you, in your goodness, and in your intentions. And we thank you that we can um, just rest in who you are. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Have a good evening.